Hello, and welcome to Makers.dev, episode number 125. Chris, this is our fifth episode number that is a number cubed. Cool. <laughs> cool. A whole number. I guess all the numbers could be numbers cubed, because we could have taken the cube root of any of the numbers. Well, but, but yes. then you get an irrational number, and... Yeah. I... Yeah. Yeah. So this is not an irrational number that's cubed. <laughs> yes. Five cubed is 125. That's my math fact of the day. That's all I got. How you doing? Cool. How was your week? I'm doing all right. Uh, yeah. I'm leaving for Iceland in two days. And so that's basically what I've been doing. I've been going crazy, trying to get everything ready. It's it's surprisingly a lot of stuff you have to do to like go leave your kids for 10 days and go yeah. to a different country. Yeah. So With kids especially. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Where are the kids just going to do a home alone? Macaulay Culkin uh, style? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, uh, grandparents are coming. Perfect. So. That makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah, that'll, that'll be fun for everybody. I have a travel hack that you've probably already figured out and have a better method for me. That's, <laughs> that's usually happens. But packing lists, oh my goodness. Essential, vital. And then I have mm -hmm. a, a routine of anytime I pack, I, I have my master packing list that's just a list of every possible thing I've ever needed to pack for any type of trip. And so I'll we'll go through before I need to go on a trip and I'll, I'll go through that list real quick and say, okay, well, I'm, I'm not going to need to wear a suit so I can take all the suit things off this list and I'm not going to go climbing so I can take all the climbing things off this list. But okay, let's go more in detail with like the toiletries thing of all the different toiletries and actually pick which ones I want to get. And uh, then after I've done that, as I'm packing, I might have the thought, oh, I also need uh, my mosquito bite zapper that helps me not itch for mosquito bites. And then... If I'm packing something that's not on the list, that gets added to the master list. So mm -hmm. just incrementally, every single trip I go on, the master list is becoming more and more fleshed out. I'm sure very soon there's going to be like a baby gear stuff section of like, make oh, sure yeah. you got the diapers and the wipes and this a whole bunch of stuff. Bring, yeah. sure. <laughs> but just like yeah. my my ambient stress of packing is, is almost zero now. I'll start packing like you know an hour before I need to go to bed the night before when I leave in the morning just really confident of like, okay, I, I know I'm not going to forget anything because I can sort of just shut my brain off and follow this procedure and I know everything's going to get packed. Do you have any sort of system like that? So, um, well, so my wife does for sure. She has like checklists in uh, Apple Notes and um, those are super helpful, especially for baby stuff because there's a million and one things. Um, when I travel alone domestically, I, I'm basically the same as you, except I almost do it off the top of my head. Like it takes me maybe half an hour to pack and mm -hmm. like no problem. This one is international travel where we have to watch that there's two, two, three problems. One international, we don't do that very often. So you have to like, remember to put your passport, you know, where are you going to uh, check it on the plane and stuff. Yeah. Um, the other one is, so we're going to Iceland where it's going to be raining a lot and we aren't camping, but we're going to be on long stretches of roads where there's nothing. So it's sort of like, you know, like it's like the day part of camping <laughs> without the night time and it's going to be raining. So there's a lot of extra things we need to worry about. All at the same time, uh, cars in Iceland are small, and we're going. Mm -hmm. So we're going with my sister-in-law and brother-in-law, and so there's gonna be four of us in one car that fits four bags, and so we have to. We can't just pack everything, right? Um, and so uh, it's mostly packing what we need for this unique trip in a small number of bags, mm -hmm. and so our normal packing uh, habits don't don't help us there there very much. Yeah, extra challenging. I like it. There's an art to it. If yeah, if you it's easy to just bring too much stuff. That's easy for domestic travel, right. especially if you're taking a road trip. And it's easy to not bring enough stuff because you just don't bring anything. There's this subtle <laughs> right. balance of just like exactly what you need. And, oh, can this thing serve this, these multiple purposes? And like, oh, do I do I actually need a toothbrush? <laughs> 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 a to no, a toothbrush. That's, that's I'm bringing smaller, a toothbrush. But, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's like how many jackets do you want? Because it's going to be rainy and it's going to be cold. Yeah. But it's not always going to be cold and it's not always going to be rainy. Yeah, yeah. So is that one jacket? Or do you need a jacket and a sweatshirt? Yeah, yeah. Need two sweatshirts and what, what do you need or yeah, could you have so. a waterproof puffy jacket that then you can unzip and then that's your one jacket yeah right exactly I, yeah. are you familiar with ultralight camping yeah so we're using not, not the camping but there's like one bag you know packing like uh so we're using some of that so we have some wool clothes like those like you're gonna hang them up you don't even have to wash them you just hang them up and they don't stink yep. uh stuff like that so we are doing some of that cool. um, but ultralight camping is a whole other thing uh, my brother did some of that and that's like where you shave your spoon down so yeah, that yeah. you don't <laughs> you save two ounces on your spoon or whatever yep. yeah <laughs> have you done any of that uh i love watching videos about it and <laughs> people, 
people who like you know instead of the whatever thirty dollar Amazon jacket that weighs four ounces will get the eight hundred dollar Arcteryx jacket yes. that has the same specs but they use some crazy material so it weighs slightly less like oh it's it's just so interesting and then you know I, I find my own balance in that um, but it's it it's inspirational to see the lengths that people go through to save weight and, and re- when they're really intentionally thinking about, okay, what is actually the minimal set of things that I need? I, I find watching people at those extremes inspirational and uh, instructional in my own process for doing that sort of thing. Yeah. I suppose the, I mean, the, the far end of that is like the TV shows like alone where they drop you in the middle of nowhere with, yeah. you know, like two tools. Yeah. yeah. Like a, <laughs> you get like a hatchet and a fire starter and they're just like, uh, here you go. Uh, yeah. Bootstrap all I the guess alone, from there. They had a pack on alone, but I, yeah. Anyway, other survival shows. Yeah. I have a ton of stuff I need to talk about, but I'm really enjoying this, this <laughs> category of conversation. So it's, I want to, I want to go a little further. Are you familiar uh, with bug out bags? Oh yeah. Like everything you need in one bag. So you can just yeah. grab it and run. Yeah. Do you have yeah. one? No. Okay. I want to... So Sarah and I are effectively making a bug out bag um, to be our hospital bag. And it's, it's going to include yeah. like, you know, two changes of clothes for each of us and the minimal baby stuff we need and snacks. And uh, I, was, I was told to bring a book so that if... Not to read it, but if, the, if you're ever bored, you just take the book out and you open it and then something <laughs> interesting will happen and you'll have to put the book away. <laughs> so, That's funny. Uh, yeah, but, but uh, I'm realizing in, in putting this bag uh the hospital bag together that it could easily then be adapted to be a bug out bag like there's going to be a bunch of freeze-dried meals in there for uh hospital food and that's a whole subcategory of people being very serious and intentional about packing stuff but the um rationale i've heard behind that is if there's if if there's ever any sort of national uh natural disaster or if there's ever any sort of you're out and about in your car and you know somebody gets shot and they're suddenly bleeding just having all of the stuff that you need to survive for the number of people that you usually carry with you for i think it's three days is the recommendation it's just constantly useful to have that amount of stuff with you all the time so uh i think that that's that's how i'm thinking about the baby bag is that it's it's going to turn into the bag bag yeah yeah that's that's interesting i car a car bag is something that i feel like I need to work on because so Indiana gets very cold winter sometimes. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you're out driving, you're in the middle of a farm, you might be, you know, a half an hour drive away from the nearest, you know, like major town or something. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, like a blanket and water and stuff like that. Like, uh, we don't have any of that in the car. We should probably, we have a first aid kit, but yeah. Yeah. Having enough food and water in your car and then any sort of national natural disaster, like, uh, you know, we're in Texas now and I think it's one of the worst heat waves on record or something. It's been over 110 for a long time. I I forgot what it's like to be below 90 (laughs) and there that puts a serious drain on the power grid. Not as much as when it's cold because something about that our infrastructure designed to withstand heat, but not withstand cold. So Hmm. there's not as many power outages now as there were before, but like that can be a serious health problem when it's 110 degrees yeah. outside. If the power goes out, okay, you you need to you're back in survival mode now. You yep. <laughs> you need to figure out how you're gonna not overheat and what you're gonna do, uh, especially with yeah. vulnerable populations. So yeah, that that just has Sarah and I thinking more about uh, disaster preparedness. And yeah. it's funny Which, in in the weeks or months after we live through a disaster, like I think it was two years ago, there was the huge power outage in Texas. In the weeks and months after that, we were really in like, okay, it kind of makes sense for us to invest whatever right. two thousand dollars in a in a generator. And it, enough time has passed since then <laughs> that I'm just like, ah, it'll be fine. Anything I yeah. need, I'll just order from Amazon. And I've, I've completely forgotten what it's like to <laughs> to be in any sort of disaster. So um, yeah. And having we, kids, I feel we, like this put me back in that frame of mind. Yeah, we do keep food and water in the basement, like just some of it. Not you know, we don't go crazy, but um, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's like uh, the quote is fire you know only, people only want to buy a fire extinguisher when they have a fire right <laughs> like, you, you don't want to buy it because they're expensive and then you're like Argh. but yeah if you have a fire you're happy you have it yeah becoming a father is putting me more in this uh like thinking of more eventualities and stuff i'm thinking more about like insurance and mm-hmm. wills and all that kind of thing having enough yeah. stuff to yeah yeah it's interesting i can i can feel myself going through the the dad metamorphosis <laughs> i'm right. about to buy some new balance shoes it's <laughs> some cargo shorts i have new balance shoes (laughs) because you're a dad that's that's what happens right (laughs) 
<laughs> it's yeah. funny because I do have New Balance. <laughs> That's the dad shoe. That's what dad's. I, I guess so. Yeah. I also just bought, uh, but they're terrible for water though. So I had to buy new shoes for Iceland because mm. uh, I like it was it was wet outside in the morning one morning when I put out the trash cans and my sock got soaked and I'm like oh, oh this is bad. <laughs> so I went and bought some waterproof shoes. Cool. Yeah. If you were going ultra minimalist and wanted just the one shoe, I think there's a spray you can get that can waterproof any sort of shoe. I've seen TikToks for it. I don't know. Uh, anything about it. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Cool. All right. I got several things I want to talk to you about. The first one, cool. first category is updates on the direct sales to loan officers in printers uh, project. Yep. Print shop. Print shop. So if you remember from last week, the current, uh, the, the, campaign that I was doing was on LinkedIn for loan officers because it's trivially easy to find loan officers on LinkedIn. So I sent out a hundred invitations to some of the loan officers in Texas and, uh, or just in DFW. And I haven't actually run numbers on this, but I think there's easily thousands just in DFW. So that's, that's a good sign. There's a big market. And also felt like a good sign that all of them were on LinkedIn and have also very polished LinkedIn's like very good photographs. Seems like they're posting, they're actually using LinkedIn. So uh, seems like that's a good place to, to find loan officers. So I sent out a hundred invitations, which I think is the, unless you do some tricks, you can send up to 500 invitations per week. Uh, so I just sent out a hundred, which uh, just doing it sustainably, I, I could potentially be sending out a hundred more invitations per week. And my rough understanding of what that funnel might look like is I send out a whole bunch of invitations, some percentage of those people accept my invitation. And then for everyone that accepts it, I can now message them. And now I can send them a sequence of something like three or four messages of like, Hey, could you tell me about your process for getting files, uh, from your borrowers, uh, outside of a loan operating system, LOS, uh, and then eventually lead to a call or, or sending them a sales video or something of those hundred invitations that I sent out one week ago today. Uh, would you like to take a guess as to how many people accepted that invitation and connected with me on LinkedIn? I don't know. I'm trying to get a read from your face, whether it was high or low, uh, for people 12. listening to this podcast, I'm exhibiting no emotion. <laughs> 12, 12 is my guess. 12 is your guess. I would feel good about 12 and I got three and I don't know uh -huh. how to feel about that. Part of it I think is the, uh, they're out there now, right? Like I've sent the invitation, they, they can be trickling in. I don't know how actively loan officers are actually uh, uh, checking LinkedIn. I certainly have had LinkedIn invitations that have sat in my invitation inbox for months. And then I open it up eventually when I open LinkedIn again. And, and I think, oh, actually, hold on. <laughs> this is a friend of mine from college. So yeah, I'd like to be connected with you. Um, yeah, but I, I don't know. I think I feel, I would have been really excited about 12 and I don't feel as excited about three. And so now I, I'm, yeah. I, I'm questioning the efficacy of this strategy. And also, if I could be sending more like 500 invitations a week, which I can do through a trick that I don't fully understand and I have to pay for like an upgraded feature on this uh, uh, CRM platform, using Octopus CRM, which is like a really cheap, easy to use one. And there's a more expensive one I can be using that's better, uh, a whole complicated thing. Anyway, if, if I am sending out 500 a week and I get 3% of those in the first week, okay, well now for 500, that's 15 people per week that now can go through the rest of the process. Uh, I guess, I, I don't know. I, I, I guess I just go through the process and I, I, for these three people, I, I send them the three messages and see what happens. Yeah, I was gonna say, have you sent any messages to these three people? No, not yet. Okay. I have them written, also, do, I know what I'm gonna send. Do you get to send a message when you connect with people, like when you send the initial invitation or no? Yeah, you can send an invitation uh, request, so, invitation, I forgot what they call it. Yeah. Like with a me like with a custom written message with a custom written message yeah, yeah i w what i would do instead of doing 500 is i would do another 100 with a different message mm. and keep doing that until you find a message that does better yeah interesting i hmm, i couldn't a b test them unless i mean? get clever like if i if i if it turns out that people actually just accept the request after two weeks uh that that number would be a little unclear did you keep a list of everyone that you yeah like a separate to? list yeah yeah, yeah i can so just i can figure out my way to do it okay yeah yeah that's not a problem okay that makes sense um okay cool 
That's but the loan officer update. Also, I would look for some information about whether or not three out of 100 is good or bad. Mm. Uh, maybe that's average. Actually, um, yeah. I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> maybe I should feel great about getting three. Um, right. Not that I should feel in a particular way, but yeah, that would that would be useful for me to, to have a benchmark of that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Next was printers. We talked last week about possible ways to get uh, in-person printer stuff. So you had the great idea last week that I just hadn't thought of. of oh, what about phone books? Like phone books are still a thing that exists. And there's right. probably just some JSON folder somewhere of a phone book that you could get or, or you know, some directory of yellowpages.com or something. And I looked into it and I don't think there is. I don't <laughs> think there's just a directory of every business based on geography which is surprising to me. I would think there would be some sort of government database, at least, of all the registrations and business types. There are places that I can spend a whole bunch of money on. Like I was going to say. Yeah, like, like yeah, you can 600 pay to to $1,000 a month. And then they do some really cool things of, like, they can tell you, they, they can identify the people who work at those businesses, and they can somehow figure out if they're looking for particular solutions, which I asked several different ways of how they're able to figure that out and didn't get a straight answer back. But the the woman who was showing me this demo was pulling up like you know let, let's look at all the businesses in dfw who are looking for file transfer solutions and then it showed me a list of all those and it, some of them were bigger companies but i was like how do you know they're looking for those she was like well we analyze their search traffic data and i was like how how do you get that <laughs> and she was like well it's aggregated over a lot of data and i was like oh, no 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 like are you, you don't have software installed on their phone and she was like well that's a technical question we'll have to ask our technical team and i was like yes i, I would At very much like to know that yeah, it's basically scary how much information people and businesses have tracked uh, that you can just buy. Um, yeah, you you can buy like location history from their phones. You can buy uh, s search history based on like who has cookies and like like other co other ad companies have cookies installed and so can see searches. Mm. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Wild. It's a whole thing. I know. It's fun being on the business side of this because people talk about oh my phone's listening to me and. Oh, I have this conversation with uh, <laughs> several of my siblings <laughs> a lot where they're convinced that their phones are listening to them because they'll have a conversation about Cats and Crunch. And then the next day on Facebook, they have an ad for Captain Crunch. And they're like, ah, how, how did they know? And consistently what I tell them is you have no idea. Like, they're not listening to you because that just doesn't make sense. That That's a very expensive thing to do. And you, you wouldn't be doing that that would drain your battery life and you know people would people would know if that was going on a lot of these operating systems are open source but you have no under, understanding of like the amount of data that they actually do have on you of how how many milliseconds you're spending looking at a particular facebook post and uh the, the people around you and what they've been googling and, and aggregating all that so i've known about this sort of academically from a from a consumer side and, and knowing a little bit about technology but it's fun if this is what they're doing, it's fun to see that from like, okay, I, I could be buying this data. Um, yeah. The wild. Yeah. It, really, yeah. really cool. In the Captain Crunch example, I explained to people, like if they wanted to, uh, they could know that they showed one of your friends a Captain Crunch ad and then they could tell by your locations that you two were together for this amount of time. Yes. And then they could show you that uh, the Captain Crunch ad later. Yes. Um, presuming that you talked about it or something like that. Yep. Uh, which is worse, I think, than listening <laughs> to you almost. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but people are not, are not freaked out about that. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, it listening, reminds me. I think, listening to me I is, is like listening to the words that I'm choosing to consciously say out loud. Right. But observing my behavior on a phone, you're you know things about me that I don't know about me that I haven't mm -hmm. been able to consciously express. Yeah, that that is scary to me. Yeah, I, I think I told the story before, but I, so I used to do real time location in hospitals, and in hospitals you do things like uh, to detect nurse rounding. You put a badge on the nurse, and then you know when she, you know they go in and out of every room, and then you can tell like how much time they spent with each patient, mm -hmm. which is very useful for uh, then they don't have to manually record it. Um, the only question we ever got asked from a privacy perspective is, are you listening to my conversations? Is there a microphone in this badge? Mm. Um, they did not care that we were tracking their location in every single room. <laughs> they cared if we were listening to their yeah, thing. That's, people get hung up on the listening. Yeah. I, th I think I think we, we weren't for the record, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> but you knew we more about them than yeah. Uh, I know we were, we were tracking whatever. every patient interaction that you have, which but see, I guess they were already doing that anyway. They they already had to manually record all the patient interactions, so sure. like I guess it didn't they didn't care about that. Sure, but, yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, anything else on the loan officer end? Uh, nope. Yep. Cool. The second main project was the... Oh, no, hold on. We've already made this transition. I'm already talking about the print shops. What am I doing? Uh, the print shops, the, oh, the yeah. uh, Yellow Pages thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yes. The uh, So I tried to find a, a directory of all the print shops. Couldn't find it. 
And so went back to the Google Maps strategy. After I read through the end user license agreement for using the Google Maps API, mm -hmm. and it seems like the thing they're most concerned about is if I steal their data and then use it in my own map service, that seems to be the mm. sort of use case that they're worried about. So it's very common. That, that's a yeah. very common clause in acceptable use policies is uh, basically don't replicate the service. Yes. Yeah. And I can't resell the service and I can't uh, cash values from the service, which that one, that one's kind of tricky because I'm, tr I'm trying to make a list of all the business names. So if I make a bunch of requests and then get the business names, that's technically caching some amount the, of data. The cash, the cash thing is often, um, so, so I, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I, I'm also, I'm a Google employee, but this has no relation to my empl employer at all. Um, caching is often so that you don't serve someone else the same data that you pulled before. Yes. Because what if they have to, what if they, like, what if a business went out of business and you're showing old data? Yeah. They don't want to be responsible for you showing old data or, yeah. you know, or like someone, or they get a cease and desist to show someone's phone number, right? They have to right. delete the phone number. They always want to make sure you have the updated thing. Right. Um, for your public facing service. Um, yes. That makes sense. That's my me. understanding. Yes. Yeah. Um, also along those lines, they want to make sure that people know that this data is coming from Google, that the end user can yeah. see that it was powered by Google or whatever. But in this case, I'm the only one using it. I'm just, yep. <laughs> and I know that Google's behind this. I'm, I'm seeing the, the uh, you know, libraries that I'm importing. I know that it's Google. So I don't think that's an issue. Uh, and I think, I think the biggest potential snag of doing something like this was that I would be caching, but I think, I think that's actually okay. So I bravely moved forward with that plan and I came up with this, I think very clever method of finding all the businesses. Something about the Google Maps API is they limit the total number of results that you can get for a given geography to 60. Hmm. And I want all the businesses of, of a certain type within the DFW Metroplex. There's a lot more than 60 print shops. So what I ended up doing was making this like uh, geography-based pagination algorithm of like okay start with a circle that encompasses it's all of dfw tiles or something okay yeah yeah which oh th okay how do you how do you tile circles if i have a circle of a given radius at a given point what's the next tile down from that this was a this was a question that i was really clever for solving you don't you do a square <laughs> you do a square okay you make dfw a square okay that's how you do it so, uh i don't i don't think i understand so the 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 API it's, it's said, instead of starting with a circle, you right. just start with a square and make your life easier. But you can't on the on the request. It asks for a point for the center and it asks for a radius, which I interpreted no, to mean does, a circle. For lat long, top and right, top, top right, bottom left. Because that's actually how, when now I that I'm thinking about it, it probably is a square. Because they're displaying it as a square. Maybe I didn't need to do yeah. any of this at all. Maybe it was actually. Maybe it was actually I, a square. I'm I, I'm just wondering. Last time I did map stuff, which was eight years ago. Yeah. it was all squares. Yeah. It, it could be radius too. So, so geographic databases have radius based lat long detection. Right. So circle detection built into it. So if they're asking for a radius, then they're actually probably doing a circle, um, but they're displaying a square, which is weird. The arguments that I give to the API are the point in the center, lat long and a radius. So I suppose yeah, what they could be probably doing a circle then. I, I probably a circle then. If it's not a circle, that what I'm about to say is doesn't matter at all. But, um, I mean, I don't know. You just tile the circles so that it fully covers this the space, right? Yes. Like yeah. So so that's yeah. my question. How do you how do you tile circles within a circle to make sure oh, that each uh, uh, smaller circle includes all of the area of the bigger circle? Oh uh, yeah, there's probably a clever formula for figuring out uh, the uh, how far overlapping the radius has to be in order to yeah exactly tile uh just thinking in pseudocode though like how if i if i gave you a circle and you had to resize a smaller circle a small a smaller set of circles that would all cover the bigger circle what what might you do uh i would do something by getting the getting the square that's inscribed by the circle and uh using the difference in radius to move my radius over if that makes sense yeah i think i follow you how how many pieces might you break it up into what do you mean when you're making smaller circles to tile the bigger circle how many smaller circles would you want to tile the the bigger circle oh i, I don't know i suppose it depends on how far down you have to go i was initially thinking that and so i made like a generic algorithm for 
uh, I always wanted it to be a square of circles. So I said, okay, well, you can take yeah. this one circle and break it up into four circles, but then the four circles have to be overlapping because I want to make sure that all the area in each of the circles still covers the initial circle. And then you're also covering a whole bunch of area that was outside the circle. But when I did that, I didn't, I didn't realize this because I just wasn't, wasn't thinking about the, the geometry. If you cut it into four, the radius that you need for each of the smaller circles to cover all of the initial circle is the same as the initial circle's radius. So you never get smaller. You, you're just hmm. moving the circles around. So that's an infinite loop. So what I did, there may be an easier way to do this, but I went to nine smaller circles. And then when they overlap, and there's a whole bunch of overlapping area because circles don't tile very well, but you know, making sure that I'm covering all the geography uh, and splitting it up into nine is the, is the way to do it that I found was correct. So anyway, the, the, uh, okay. the, the whole algorithm was like, okay, take your one big circle for all of DFW and then uh, check if there are more than 60 results. And if there are, then split it up and recursively uh, search in each of the tiles. And so what that does that I thought was pretty clever is I don't have to be thinking about what's the maximum zoom level that I want. That makes uh, sense. Because it doesn't matter what the maximum zoom level is. It's just, are there more than 60 businesses in this area? And after I did that, to get all 60, you have to like make multiple requests and do pagination. After I already implemented that, I realized, oh, actually, I could just be saying if there are more than the maximum results on a single page, which I think is 10, the whole thing would go much faster because then I just take a snapshot of DFW. Oh, there's more than 10. Get smaller. Oh, there's more than 10. Get smaller. Oh, now you're in the middle of nowhere. There's zero. Okay, you're done with that one. Go to the next one. Oh, there's more than 10. Go smaller. Okay, now we have five. Good. Next one, four. Great. Uh, next one, two. Okay, and then, and sure. then it goes all over. So, uh, yeah, I was I was pretty, uh, pretty proud of that. felt cool algorithmically and i'm totally off base from the topic of this which is <laughs> talking about marketing and sales but this was a really fun engineering problem so anyway in i went through that to, whole thing. in order to do marketing and sales you had to solve the tile or the circular tile test solution problem that was yeah. the most interesting part of this for me uh but yeah it was fun so after going through all that i found um 556 small businesses so i filtered out all of like the big uh vista print is one of the big right uh things and like fedex and uh Walmart, I think, showed up for print services. Uh, 556 small businesses that I now have from Google Maps, their address, phone number, website, business name, and then I built a really simple script to fetch their website and look for regex of something that looked like an email address. And a lot of these customers that I'm targeting have very simple websites where they just have their email address listed on the website. Yep. So for a lot of them, I also have emails. And then in parallel with that, I found on... Uh, LinkedIn, you can search in a given geography, a business category. I was having a lot of trouble finding people who were print shop owners on LinkedIn. I just wasn't sure what to search for, but it was really easy to find the business pages that were print services businesses. And then I wrote a web scraper to go through all of those businesses of which there were 847, which was interesting that that was so much more than the 556 that I found on Google yeah. Maps. But I, I think some of them were kind of weird and showed up if there were employees in DFW of that business. I'm, I'm not quite sure what's right. going on on LinkedIn. Um, so I went through all of those 847 printing services businesses in DFW and got all of their employees, of which there were 4,073. So I think a lot of those 847 printing businesses have like a lot of employees. And then I filtered those 4,000 employees for people whose titles were president, owner, or founder and got a much more reasonable 428. So here's what I'm sitting on right now, and I'm not quite sure what to do next on the uh, print shop front. I have 556 from Google Maps, addresses, phone numbers, websites, business names, and some emails for print businesses. And on the LinkedIn side, I have 428 profiles of people who say they are a president, owner, or founder of a print shop business in DFW. What would you do next? I can go. I I think an obvious thing to do is take all the all the LinkedIn people and try simultaneously uh, LinkedIn outreach thing, doing the same CRM stuff that I'm doing with the the loan officers. It might be that you know because they're not as active on LinkedIn, when they get a request, it's a lot cooler, and they're like, "Ooh, <laughs> LinkedIn request. Let me, let me talk to this guy." Um, or, or it could be they just ignore LinkedIn. <laughs> could be they just ignore LinkedIn. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also, I'm not sure what to do with all the emails and 
phone numbers and uh, physical addresses I have. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I don't either. I feel like any advice I give would just be guessing, which um, I would take guesses. I think that's what the process is going to look like is just try a bunch of experiments and, and see what actually yeah. sticks. And I only need one of them to work, right? If I figure out, oh my gosh, if I just send this letter <laughs> to print shops, uh, you know, the letter cost me 20 cents to send out. I can generate infinite amounts of these lists of leads from Google Maps. Uh, and then, you know, 1% of those people convert, uh, that, yeah, okay. I found, I found my one thing. Let's just do that as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. My best advice is sort of meta advice, which is to find someone who's done it before. Okay. Um, that like, I so talk Scott to later today and he, yeah, yeah, he's got me through process. Talk to yeah. him. Also, there's probably loads of information online about this, although you have to watch out because anyone who's teaching how to reach out to small businesses is probably selling a course or something like that. So yeah, sure. uh, be careful about that. But there's probably lots of information about what happens when you reach out to you know small businesses and how to best do that. Mm -hmm. um, you could also just post on Twitter, say, you know, I'm reaching out to small businesses, you know, who has done that before? Can I talk to you about how it went? Oh, the microcom like Slack might be a good place to right. uh, ask in there. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I would do that. Yeah, sure. Sure. Okay. So that's what I would do because I, I could tell you like, I mean, don't, don't waste all emails in one go. Like, you know, do, do it for 10 people, then 20 people, then 50 people. And, mm -hmm. you know, so like you can build up your, either your confidence or your, you know, your tactics. Um, so that I think is pretty good advice, but in, in terms of like how actually to reach out or anything, I, I actually have no idea. Okay. Sorry. Cool. Fair. No. Yeah. I, I don't know is a perfectly <laughs> reasonable answer. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm curious to reach out to people on the microconf list. Cause I, yeah, there's a lot of people in there who do direct sales that it's interesting. Like thinking about this as a sales problem instead of a marketing problem feels so much more tractable. Cause now it's like, okay, mm -hmm. here are the people in this area that I could talk to that I think would be good customers of this. It's not this much more nebulous. Like, let me write a page for people who might be Googling for this problem, which right. I think is a really good marketing tactic, but uh, feels like a much harder game to play than like if there's a person here and I'm talking with them about a problem they have, and I can ask them what their objections are and they can tell me and then I can make stuff to, uh, it, it feels like a tighter yeah. feedback loop. Um, yeah. yeah. Also, if you can't do direct sales, like you'll never be able to do marketing at scale. Right. Like right. you need to be able to do the direct sale, you know, in order to know what they need and, and all that stuff. So exactly. like any, any work you do with sales is going to help you tremendously in marketing later. Yeah. So, if I have, yeah. if I can sell 10 of these in conversations, I'm going to hear all the objections. I'm going to hear yep. what's actually important to the person. And then that goes on the marketing page. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. This I'll, feels I'll so good. I, I, I feel like I'm not yeah. lost. Any, like I have a attack. I, I'm yeah. moving forward. I'm, I'm trying stuff but like, oh, it, it, this feels like a much better place than I was in uh, even just a couple months ago. Yeah. I was also going to say at, at your price point, if you can do 10 sales and then repeat that a few times, then you don't need marketing. You can just right. keep repeating that. Right. So yeah, figure yeah. out how to sell it 10 times. Yeah. Even if I was doing the back of the envelope calculation on this, even if I'm selling subscriptions for $30 a month, if I can get a lower churn, which I think I have a higher chance of getting lower churn if I'm selling this to people individually, because then like, you know, they know me and I've custom tailored it to them. Um, to get to 10K MRR, uh, which would be like life changing for me. That that would be impactful. Um, I'm at like 3,800 right now, so I need 6,000, uh, 6,200 more. And if uh, it's 30 a month, I need 207 people. And that feels like something I can do. Like I don't know how to do it yet, but it just feels like that doesn't feel like a huge number. So, yeah. Like if I'm, if I can somehow sell three people a week, well, that would be 68 weeks. Oh, but actually 68 <laughs> weeks isn't that long. That's like a little more than a year. Yeah. If you, I can I mean, get to 10K have, in a year, like, yeah, that, that feels good, right? $100 a month plans, right? Like, yeah. So some of those will be $100 a month plans is what I said, right? Yes. Yeah. So. Which would count for and, three of those people. Yeah. So every week I could either sell three $30 a week people, $30 a month people or, or $100 one, a month per people. Yeah. yeah. And if you start hearing lots of objections and you start building things in order to satisfy those objections, then you can start charging more money. And yes. that's why people charge more money because then yeah. you only have to sell half of a person every week, you know, or yes. whatever. So, yes. Yeah. And churn is an element of this that, you know, it'll probably have to sure. sell a little more people than that. But yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I'm feeling good. 
Um, okay, cool. The other category of thing that I wanted to talk with you about is the serverless transition. So I, uh, uh, we're going to have an actual real live baby out in the world <laughs> in 43 days. Isabella awesome. will become is a baby, which I'm excited about. <laughs> uh, quick aside, we're, we, we almost have all the gear we want. I think the last thing is a, a glider, which is like a rocking chair, but it can't pinch your fingers. Uh, and I think we're going to pick that up probably sometime this week. So feeling good on the gear front. Plus we got like our baby go bag anyway. Um, so before that happens in 43 days, I'm, I'm feeling the fire underneath me of like, this is the time to, to do this serverless transition. It's got to happen. So what I would love to do is talk through all the things that need to be done. We've done this a few times before, but it would be helpful for me to do it again, especially because the environment has changed. Of I have a way to outsource these projects now. So yeah, if you wouldn't mind, I'd love just your gut check on all these things. Let's do it. Let's do it. The uh, I have this split into two pieces. The, the first piece is stuff that I think only I can do, and the second piece is stuff that I can outsource. First thing that I think only I can do is finish the Stripe integration on the new platform. So it was a little bit complicated. I had a legacy Stripe plan that didn't support the Stripe checkout page and I got all that ironed out. So now I have a way to go from my Firebase app to the Stripe page and I, oh, this was great. I can, I can use legacy accounts. So right now I have a whole system of like how I'm generating invoices for people who want that. Um, on if if i if i just import the stripe id and associate that with a customer and then send them to the firebase checkout page they can see a list of all of their previous receipts like the the stripe customer underlying it is consistent and so now i can just dump all the data that i was saving of all the stuff that stripes keep keep track of the of the uh, invoices and stuff and the only thing i care about is what's the person's stripe id and are they currently active and so uh, there's a little more polish in that that needs to be wrapped up. I need to uh, actually implement the feature gating of like, which plan is each person on. I feel a temptation to like over-engineer this a little bit. And uh, the dream that I have is I would love to be able to like, when I'm on a call with a customer, they say, oh, this sounds great, but I'd really like these three sets of features for roughly this amount. I'd love to on the call be like, oh, sure. And in Stripe, make a new plan just for them and somehow within Stripe note what their features are and then they have access to that plan. I don't know if that's possible and I also see that as a huge engineering distraction because that, oh, that would just be so tasty so, to be able to do. So you have, you have 43 days. Yes, so that gets cut. So, so Done. Don't do that. Good, thank you. Okay, so the, yeah. the main thing I think I need to do there is just wrap up, uh, uh, like make a, make a system for which plan has which features and that can just live in code. That's fine. That'll just be like a JSON file of, for this plan ID that you you get these features and it's this thing. And then, yeah, sort of like CanCan, -can, but I, I want to re-implement CanCan -can in JavaScript. Okay, that's the first thing. Um, next thing I need to, uh, and this is something that really only makes sense for me to do because I have an intimate knowledge of both systems. I need to import all the users and pages from the Rails app into the new app. That's going to be a little complicated. I'm glad I'm talking this through because... Right now in Rails, I have, uh, you know, a person has a user ID that's just their Stripe ID that's an auto incrementing ID, and they have, so they, they have the user ID and the Stripe ID. But the way that things are stored in Firebase is that when a new user is created, they get a random ID. And I don't think I have any control over what that random ID is going to be. But they will have the same email, and they'll have a Stripe ID. And I need to make in two separate collections, I need to associate the user ID with the Stripe ID. Um, cause the Stripe ID is not public. Like a, a, a user doesn't know what their Stripe ID is within my system. So I think what I might do for that is just if I loop through every single rails user, and then I think I can programmatically create users with an email login in the new system. And then I'll get their ID after I've made that. And then I make the, the customer object is this private collection that, that stores the Stripe ID. Then I think after I have the user ID, then I just make the, the customer object and then store the Stripe ID in that. And then the first time they log in on the new system, they'll need to reset their password, which I think is fine. And I'll, I'll send out an email about that. Okay, that seems reasonable. Any thoughts on that? No, sounds good. Cool. Uh, potential complexity in importing the pages is I have different ways that I'm storing things in pages now. So I just need to write a function that like, what I'll probably do is just export all the pages from the existing app as JSON and then write a function that maps those to what the current pages look like 
and then import all those in Firebase. And do I want to do this like all at once or have it continuously update? I'm just going to be a little sloppy so, with it. I'm just going to do it once. And there's, there's not that many people making pages that fast. I was going to say I would do it once, but then have some kind of check later. Like um, when a person comes over, if they have made a page since you did the dump, yeah. then they'll want to see it. Yes. What I could do then, I'll do the initial one, keeping in mind that I'll need to do it one more time. And then the one more time that I do it, I'll just look for all the pages that have been updated since I last did it. Yeah. And then I'll just update update those. Yeah. Okay. That's exactly what I want to do. Okay. Uh, third of five things that I need to do. I have legacy tokens for like the Dropbox app and the, and the Google Apps app. Mm -hmm. And those OAuth tokens are stored in the database. And I don't have those tokens in the new one. So I just need to keep track of a few more things of like, and I, I want this to just seamlessly work. I don't want people to have to, to re-authenticate. So right. I'll need to, as part of importing the users, keep track of what their OAuth tokens are and keep track of that the the uh, private key for those OAuth tokens isn't the main one that I have for the app. It's the it's the legacy tokens. So that shouldn't be too hard. I'll just I'll just, you know, name their integration Dropbox old or something and then sure. and the Dropbox old has, has two other keys. Okay, so that, that should be pretty good. Um, onboarding is a thing that I think makes sense for only me to do because this is going to require a lot of thought of like what's the ideal onboarding. Right now, there's no onboarding on the new one and I've wanted to do a revamp of the whole onboarding but I'm going to scale that back and just have like a reasonable homepage. I can just copy the existing homepage I have and which is bad but like it's fine. That, that's what's existed and copy right. the existing onboarding flow. And in the process of that, I just want to capture, I, I might have grandiose thoughts of, oh, but onboarding would be so much better if I could <laughs> automatically pull their colors from their website and have that automatically. Think, okay, no, calm down. Uh, just, <laughs> just have a, a copy what you're doing on the Rails app, which is simple. And I, I know that it has worked a little bit, even though it's bad and capture the improvements that I'd like to make. And in racing towards this deadline, just, just re-implement that. Um, yep. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? No, yeah, keep it simple. Okay. Yeah. And then the very last thing that only I can do is to do the final DNS swap, which is going to be a day. That's going to be exciting. Uh, it's probably going to sweat a lot. Uh, but yeah, that, it doesn't make sense to outsource that because something's probably going to go wrong and I'm going to need to pull uh. it back. And uh, yeah, I'll, on that day, I'll like do the final page swap uh, or uh, page resyncing. And any new users that have been created, I'll, I'll copy those over too. And then, uh, yeah, I'll swap it over. And hopefully all this serverless stuff lives <laughs> up to its promise of being able to like take traffic. Yeah. And th there's a lot of traffic that goes to this. Yeah. My only advice there is maybe look at your logs to see when people aren't using it, you know, like a Sunday night or something. Yeah. And smart. do it then. Smart. Do off hour. Yeah. Off hour update. Uh, but otherwise, yeah. Because it's all it, DNS stuff always takes time. So, yeah. I also want to send out an email warning people this is going to happen. Um, mm, yep. And just to check their page and let me know. Uh, oh, and I can let uh, Jasmine know about it so she can be on call to do emails. Yeah, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Um, cool. Okay, that's all the stuff that I need to do. Then there's one, two, three, four, five, uh, five things that I can outsource to other people. So uh, one of those is already done. It's the internationalization, uh, which, oh, nice. it's, it's just <laughs> warms my heart every time I think about it, that I had this feature of this thing that needed to get done and I described it in words and then it got done. <laughs> And it took a lot of my time still of like doing the code review and stuff, but that's fine. Because, uh, you know, the, the, it's as a proof of concept, I've proven that I can outsource work and it actually gets done and it makes good features. So that feels good. There were a few times in the code review where I felt really cool, where I like, <laughs> I, I dunked on Ben a little bit because he, he, he would have, you know, like a, like a 10 line function or something. And I suggested a change that changed the entire 10 line function to one line. And that felt kind of cool. <laughs> it's, but we're, we're being, I don't know if dunking on your employees I know. should uh, be I know. part of your code I, review. Something process. I'm very conscious of is like, I really want this to be a valuable experience for him. I value so much the the ability to be able to do this. Um, and we talked about it and, and kind of joked about it. But like, yeah, it it felt cool. And I want to make sure <laughs> I, he's having a good time. Yeah. 
I was going to say, I, I mean, I would frame it like he's still he's still in college, right? right. So like I would frame it frame it all as learning opportunities. Yes. <laughs> instead, of, <laughs> instead of dunk. Yeah. Yeah. Which is fine. Yeah. I shouldn't, I shouldn't use the phrase dunk. <laughs> um, but he, that's, that's, uh, in talking with him about like what would make this experience worth it for him and, and a uh, good environment that he likes. One of the things he said is having detailed code reviews is very useful to him because yeah. I think he feels some anxiety around pushing code to production. And so like for him to feel confident pushing stuff, knowing that I've looked at it and vetted it and, uh, made improvements to it. And like, I, I am, if, if it breaks the site, I am as culpable as he is. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, is the sort of thing that he's looking for. So, yeah. The, the other thing I'll say, uh, actually that comes to mind is as an employee before I have purposefully written the more verbose thing sometimes because, you know, now other people are reading your code mm. and now, you know, like, like if I want to write a 10 line, you know, for loop instead of an inject lot function or something mm -hmm. like that, that is oftentimes a, you know, a good way to do it. Yeah. If you're not the one in charge of the code or you're not, you know, there's someone else reading your code. Yeah. So just to see if people know. are paying attention. No, because it's more readable. Oh, oh, like, yeah, like sure. a for loop instead of a reduced statement or something like yes. often when you take 10 lines and condense it into one, it becomes a slightly less readable. Yes. Um, so, yes, yeah. I don't want to get too in the weeds, but it made, it was just better overall. It was, it was yeah. simpler. Okay. He was, okay. he was transforming the data t totally reasonable and perfectly functional and could have been shipped to production with no material consequence. The, the feature would have worked exactly as it would have, but he was taking data and uh it, it was an object and he was splitting the object into uh entries object on two entry in javascript and then he was mapping over those just to transform the shape of the data and instead okay. of doing all that you could have just used the original object oh and then, and then he like did from entries after that instead of doing that you could have just used the original object uh, sure. and mapped it and then the map would change the shape of the data so oh no you can't no i didn't map it what did i do I mean, you could have mapped it and returned it, right? I didn't map it, though. It, it's an object. So it, I'm getting in the weeds. It, it was good. It was it was a good, good okay. change. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so the the uh, that first thing, internationalization, is done. The next thing on that outsource list is implementing admin pages on fileinbox.com, the legacy Rails app. I have admin pages where I can see like all of the pages that everyone's created and all of the users and what stage they are in the pipeline. So uh, that's not something I need to do. If that page sucks, it doesn't matter because I and uh, Jasmine, my assistant, are the only people who are going to actually look at it. So yeah, that's uh, being outsourced. That's just going to be like a, a list of the users that can scroll uh, I need a way to, to be able to search for users and uh, view detailed lists about like who they are and how much they've paid me and what plan they're on and, and that sort of thing. Yes. I also love, by the way, I think we've talked about this before, but uh, my admin pages are the same way. It's like unstyled garbage. Yeah. And it's like, it's so funny that like <laughs> the stuff we try to present is like, you know, nicely formatted yeah. and CSS and everything. And then the stuff we it, it have internally is just like, just give me the data yeah. on the screen. I don't care what it looks like. <laughs> a lot of my pages. <laughs> So like I have a button in my current app to give people a refund without logging into Stripe. And when you've successfully given someone a refund, the message that you see is just the JSON return from the Stripe API. Yeah, <laughs> And when exactly. I was first working with Rachel, the, the first uh, assistant that I hired to help me do support, and I, I was just walking her through roughly like, okay, and here's how you do refund and blah, blah, blah. And uh, the first refund she had to offer, she emails me in a panic and she's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I think I broke, I think I broke your app. I don't understand this. <laughs> like I was trying to offer someone a refund and then, and then I saw this yeah. and she sent me a screenshot and I was like, oh no, that's, that means it worked. <laughs> <laughs> that means, that means you successfully gave them a refund. <laughs> that's, um, yeah. So I, <laughs> it's fun now though with Tailwind components because it's, it's almost easier to make it look good because you yeah. just copy it and you know you, you inject your own data into it. So that's that's probably what we'll do. Um, anyway, so that admin pages was the first one. Um, there's a few collections that need to be infinitely scrolled. So like responses for for a page. Right now, I think there's just a maximum of a hundred. I could ship without doing this technically, and I don't want to. Uh, yeah, and it's a, sucks. it's a pretty small change and also was an, as a, a good experience for Ben to experience more of the code base. So yeah, in, infinite scrolling is, and then that, that can also be used on the admin pages and just figuring that out. Um, I currently don't have form errors. If you have a field that's required in one of the file inbox forms, uh, and this is something that the new app does not do that the old app does do. Uh, if, if you have like a missing field 
it just won't let you submit the form. It doesn't tell you an error, yeah. and that's a terrible end user experience. Yep. So that needs to get cleaned up before uh, I actually swap this over. Uh, there's a small thing that needs to be done where for files that are being sent, so I, I have like file receiving, that's the main business, and then I was experimenting with this file sending feature where you could send anyone any file. Currently, I just have all those files that have ever been sent in the last, whatever, six months since this has been uh, implemented. Those all just still exist. If you visit the URL, you can still download the file. And so those need to be automatically deleted. And I think that's a thing that can be outsourced because that's like its own little self-contained project. It's also something you do not have to ship within 43 days. Uh, that's true. Yeah, that's totally true. We can cut that. Unless someone's stealing all your bandwidth, you know. It also seems like a small feature, but I would save that to last. Yeah, let me move that right now. That's in the serverless transition automatically delete those files also because that, that's a small feature that uh could potentially do something like delete all the files in your whole system yeah, or something you know if, like you mess up the query yep so that's totally valid that can wait thank you this is why we have these conversations and then the last thing is moving the blog posts over that's something that i could do but i don't want to so i'm going to outsource yep. it uh there i built like really simple cms in both the rails and the and the new one and they just need to be copied over oh and a corollary to that is on the on the current oh you might have an opinion on this so uh, articles are seo pages that say you know it, the title is something people might be googling and then i have a short description of how to do it with file inbox and forever, I had those paths as fileinbox.com slash articles slash and then the slug of the article. And I was talking with Jonathan Zachs, uh, another microconf person. Uh, he runs goreminders.com with a co-founder. And he was saying it's much better for SEO if you don't have that articles, if it's just the top level fileinbox.com slash article title. So I did some funny stuff in the Rails router and moved those over and then did redirects from the articles pages. And... Yeah, so now there's now there's redirects from articles to the main path. Uh, first, I think I just want to ask your opinion. Do, do you know anything about that in SEO, if that actually matters? I know very little SEO things, okay. So and it changes all the time. So, yeah. yeah, I have zero idea. Okay. The easy thing to do for me would be just set up another handful of redirects from that uh, base domain to yeah you don't want to you don't want to break any existing links so yeah i would have it all still work if what that's what you're asking because I, I have two separate urls now that that people might think is pointing to the article there's the slash but you're article, gonna do a dns writer. redirect right yeah redirects are gonna have to be involved either way but what do i want the final path to be i'll keep it as it is that's the easiest way to do it yeah so it'll it'll just be following com slash article slug the complexity in that is my file upload pages also are using the same thing as file com slash your your page slug mm. but that's fine that just means for every get request i need to query the database twice once for the articles and once for uh, everything else but i think that's okay um and that's it those are all the things i need to do before i do the serverless transition and half of those that does not i'm outsourcing which feels great that does not sound that bad no we're slowly slowly whittling whittling down oh i forgot one which is security codes but that's almost done uh that's almost done it's, some people want a security code on their file upload page but that was sort of tricky to implement because like you can't right now i just have the security code stored in postgres on the legacy rails app that's just one of the attributes in postgres but that doesn't work for a firebase app because you either the whole document is publicly available or it's not and it needs to be publicly available so that people can load it. So there's there's real tricky things I could do in that to try to mask it and make it so that people can't get it. But that's much more complicated than just have a separate collection of storing the, the security code. So yeah. I just need to treat that a little a little differently. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That feels tractable. That I can get that done in 43 days. If this was like a consulting project, it'd be like, oh, I'll get that done in a week for you. And then I would spend, <laughs> I would spend 43 days doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm feeling good on that front too. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Sounds reasonable. Glad you're Yeah, getting ready. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Do it doing the stuff. When I talked with a very expensive uh like business coach consultant person, he helped walk me through this exercise of like what 
what work am I least going to be able to do with a newborn baby? And immediately mm. I said, well, this, you know, the, the development stuff, because that needs me to be able to hold big chunks of this application in my head all at once and requires these bigger architectural decisions and especially doing the final swap, like I'm going to need to be on my A game and uh, be able to put fires out and stuff. And so he said, great, do that at all costs. And like, even if you need to table some uh, sales marketing stuff, like make sure you get right. that done. So yeah, that's that's how I'm currently framing it. I have one cool. last thing I wanted to talk about, which is our weight loss projects. How's that going for you? I have an update for you. I have completely stalled since I uh, went on a trip and then I'm going on another trip. I have given myself permission to ignore my weight loss <laughs> for this time, time period. Yeah, so I've just been maintaining. How about you? That's exactly how it's been going for me. <laughs> I was doing so well. I made all that progress in the beginning and I was like, oh, this is gonna be yep. easy. I'll be done in like two weeks. And then stalled. Oh, then I went on a trip and then bounced back up like four pounds. And I was like, ah, oh, no big deal. I'll just get back on the same trajectory. And my goodness, I, you know, I've had more trips since then. I think I got sick or something once or got injured and couldn't work out or something. Uh, and then there was a cake at one point and I ate a whole bunch of the cake. <laughs> that was a great cake. And I, I like, I've dipped below 180, I think three times and then something happens and I, and I bounce back up, but it's frustrating. I see why people sort of get discouraged with this. I was talking yeah. a big game at first, but yeah, this is hard. Um, yeah. I'm also becoming skeptical of my goal i sort of arbitrarily set this goal of 170 just because i remembered feeling good at 170 but i've been lifting since then so presumably i have more muscle mass and i think the solution to this is to get a dexa scan are you familiar with that mm. yeah they, it's it's like the more accurate way to determine muscle mass yeah and and just all overall body composition i think i think it'll tell okay. you like bone density i think it'll tell you exactly oh, how cool. much fat you actually have uh and there's there's some sort of shortcut calculation you can do but this like is actually measuring the volume of, of fat on your body so i think i'm just going to continue doing i i'm liking this routine i have of uh fasting until 2 p.m and eating good food trying not to eat cake and uh <laughs> trying to have some sort of workout every day either walking or uh lifting three times a week or uh you know the, the vr boxing or, or something like that um I did gymnastics the other day with Sarah. That was that was pretty fun. And reevaluate what my goal is after the Dexas can. Because it sure mm -hmm. seems like my body would like to weigh 180. And <laughs> if that's how much it's going to weigh, then that's fine. But I'd like to know okay. that that actually is a, a good weight to, to weigh. Yeah, sounds good. Cool. Chris, that's all I got. That's all I got too. Then I will see you next week. Oh, no, you're going to be in uh, uh, Iceland next week. Yeah, yeah, two weeks. Okay, I'll see you in two weeks. Sounds good. Goodbye.